Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted with Susan Schmidt. So fun. So the credits for these intros, by the way, go to our son, Will, who does the little improvisations for us. So welcome, welcome to another episode of Live and Unscripted. I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And today's project is actually going to be two quilts. Now, you'll be seeing double. I'll show you them in a minute. The two quilts are identical and they're the same size. So the lady who made them, my friend Janet, she gave me a huge backing so that I, well, it's a long backing, so that I can load the whole backing and do the quilts one right after another and only have to load one time. So the agenda for today is that we're going to load and quilt that first one and go through the process of loading the second one so that you can kind of see how I do that. And it is neat when, when you're able to do that, if it's your quilt or a client's quilt, it saves on a lot of fabric because you don't need that perimeter around all four sides of the quilt. You can butt quilt number one and quilt number two right nose to tail and really save a lot of fabric space that way and also save loading time because you only have to load the one time. So I'll walk you through that today. Um, it's a bright and cheery little patchwork quilt. Uh, you can't see the backing. Let me lift it up so you can. Bright and cheery backing too. Pink polka dots and I'm color coordinated as well. Thought this through. <laughs> oh yeah and the quilt behind me too. Yeah. No intentionality there, but it's what happened. So, live and unscripted episodes are just that, streamed live so that you get to see how a project goes down in my studio in real time. I know as a beginner quilter, I would have found this invaluable just to be able to watch someone do it. The simple things like starting and stopping and the loading of a quilt, the basting of a quilt, like how do you keep it square, all those things we learn so well by watching and long arm quilting is not something you often get to watch someone do just on an ordinary everyday quilt. So that's my goal is to bring that to you and just to welcome you into my process. It is not always perfect. It is not always without oopses, but if the oopses happen, I'll share them with you. I'll share my efforts at solution and I'm just welcoming you into my studio to watch me at work. And because I'm a talker and an explainer, I'll chat while I do it about some of the choices and the decisions. And also you are welcome to ask any questions you like and I'll answer them while I work. So if you would put a cue in front of your questions, um, it helps us to find them. If there is a lot of chatting going on, we can search for the cues and bring up the questions and be sure to get those answered for you. I try to pause kind of at the end of each pass to have some dedicated question reading time and then I can put them on the screen so you all can see them. So that's what this is about. I do this live streaming the first and third Friday of each month and the product the projects vary a little bit. It depends on what's coming in from my clients but I try to choose ones that have you know points of interest. So in this case it's the loading two quilts one right after another. Sometimes it's wavy borders, sometimes it's thread selection on a multicolored quilt, whatever the thing is. And I just talk through those decisions and choices as I work. So I would love if you would like and subscribe that supports my channel. And even if you would share, there is still time today even to share this with a friend who would be interested in this style of quilting too. So hit that like button that helps me get some great views. And I sure appreciate that on YouTube. This, this channel, this process is so well received. I hear from so many of you that it's helpful that it's enjoyable and that is my goal that makes me very happy so like and subscribe if you hit the bell you will also receive notifications whenever I do go live so that's helpful also if you're interested in supporting this show we have a really easy way for you to do that you can just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan and there you can choose either a one-time donation for as little as five dollars or you can do a monthly subscription either way we appreciate it all of that goes to bettering our equipment so we can produce better sound for you, better video quality, more cameras, those sorts of things. So we sure appreciate your help. Many of you have been very generous there. The mic that I'm wearing, for example, you know, I don't know that you guys are into the tech world, but this is a couple hundred dollar mic. If you go back to my episodes, you know, six months or a year ago, there was interference and crackling. And so this upgrade is what makes a better show for you. So thank you for all of you that do that. We appreciate it when you support. 
Um, and a few credits are due as well. I mentioned our son Will does the intros with the little improvised voices and there's there's different ones a few different ones that we rotate through we appreciate that my husband dave is always behind the scenes he's standing in front of me behind a bank of monitors and wires and headphones and cameras and all the things juggling all the stuff and also our good friend dan provides the music that plays while i'm quilting the really gentle guitar music those of you who are faithful watchers have heard it about a million times and it's still wonderful so thank you to dan for allowing us graciously to use his music. We appreciate it. Okay, today's topics, I've kind of delved into that long quilt backing, and we're going to load two tops, one right after another. And I think I'm going to go ahead and get started, and then I'll keep chatting about some other places you can find me if you're interested as I'm working today, okay? So the backing is this gorgeous two shades of pink polka dot. And I'll talk a little bit about the loading process as I work today because I make decisions about this um, differently for each project. I don't think there's a right and a wrong way. For example, most quilters prefer to have the, the joining seams running horizontally and so do I whenever that's possible. But I also need to have a straight edge on this side also often when I load a quilt, it's more efficient to have it loaded long ways this way because then I have fewer advances and passes as I'm rolling it through the long arm. But for today's purposes, because I've got this long backing and two quilts, they are actually going to be loaded long ways. So there's going to be more passes. That's the trade-off for being able to just do the one load. So th like I said, there's no right and wrong way to do it, but this is the way I choose today. So I'm using the red snapper system, which means in this red material, there's a little bar that runs through the hem of my leader. And this is kind of a U-shaped channel. And I just snap this bar over the one in my leader. So I've got a straight edge on my fabric here. So I know that if I line that up with my hem, that this edge of my quilt will be straight. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. And I'm just taking care not to stretch nor to gather my fabric. And I, I do that by watching how smoothly it's laying. If I see any creases or pulling or if I see any rumples, I know I've got too much in it. So I'm just being aware of those things as I'm loading. And I'm not sure why I did the little one first except that I was talking. But it doesn't really matter. So again, I'm lining up my straight edge with the hem of my leader. That's my visual guideline. Perfect. And at that point, I've just got the bulk of my long backing just extended over the other side of the long arm. I never know whether to call that the back or the front. But anyway, your side of it. And now I'm going to pull that all across nice and smooth. I might have to walk back and forth a little bit today because I've got camera equipment here. Usually I would spread the entire length of this backing out as flat as I could across the floor. As it happens today, I am limited for space. So let's see if I can fold it in kind of accordion pleats. What I'm after is making sure that I don't have it pulled in either direction. Can you see how when it's pulled even half or three quarters of an inch, I start getting these ripples across it. That's how I know it's not straight and I want to take care to get it very straight and have it falling straight off the back of the long arm so that I can roll it on without any difficulty. And I'm just giving it a light spritz just with water that will relax some of the folding creases so that there's no need to press it. And at this point I will just start rolling. And what's happening, I'll come back here, this edge along here is not cut perfectly straight. Which camera am I on, hon? This camera? This edge is not cut perfectly straight. You can see that. 
And I'm not worrying about that. As long as this is advancing straight onto my roller, that little bit of excess will just be trimmed off later. It will not interfere with getting a square quilt. And I should put a disclaimer in here. There are reasons, for example, if you're doing a show quilt and you want it millimetrically square, or maybe you've got a wide back and it's really distorted on the grain, as sometimes happens to them, there are reasons for taking more precautions and more in-depth measures to get this straight, but for the average quilt, this works. Loading a straight edge at the front, making your backing fall straight off the other side of the long arm, and then just rolling it on makes a nice and flat and square quilt or helps, it's one step in the process. So I'm watching as I roll to see that there are no creases being rolled on. I'm watching this edge down on my rollers to see that it's staying pretty straight, knowing there are little jogs in the fabric, but if it was veering off an inch, I would stop and see where do I need to adjust things. If there are creases here, I take the time to smooth them out. And then I just keep rolling. As Dory says, keep on swimming. And now I'm watching under my leader for the edge of that backing. And here it comes. And now I'll grab a couple more of my red snappers and come around and attach the other end. I'm just going to give a little more spritzing with water because some of this was piled up on the floor and didn't get the first spritz. That water, by the way, is magical. Even heavy creases, like for example, the fold of fabric when you buy it off a bolt, even that will relax enough with a gentle spritz of water that you don't have to iron before you load. I can't remember the last time I actually ironed a quilt backing but it's been a long time. Huge time saver. All right, do the last little bit of rolling. And just like that, our backing is loaded. And look how nice and smooth that is. You can see pretty even tension all the way across. There's no bits that are sagging, no bits that are pulled tight. I'm happy with it. This edge, as it happens, was also straight, but if it happened to not be straight, I would have just let the excess hang off a little further beyond my snappers where I clipped them on, and I wouldn't have to trim that up and square that up either. So, huge time saver. All right, on to the batting. I'm using my favorite Hobbs 8020 today 80% cotton, 20% poly. Now this is a piece that was left over from beside another quilt. And I see that it's plenty, plenty wide. So Dave, would you mind handing me a pair of scissors, second drawer there? What I'm going to do is trim off the edge. I have learned from experience that if I have excess batting hanging off this edge, it's apt to catch in the rollers of my long arm as I'm moving around and make a terrible mess. So it, it does not serve you well. It costs you time in the long run if you have excess batting hanging off the edges. So I'm just gonna trim it quickly to be about the same width as my fabric. And I folded it up in half only to make the trimming easier. You certainly could also just trim the area that's exposed to begin with and do more later. I also like to be able to see the edge of my fabric as I'm working to. I'm always lining things up there, so. Now I can see it just a little bit on both sides. Lovely. So I'm lining up my batting fairly straight with my red snapper that's at the top. It's all smooth and ready to go. And look, we're seeing double, two quilts. They're exactly the same, the same colors. So obviously the same backing works, the same thread is going to work. 
and I'll tell you about the thread when we get started. Remind me if I forget. Isn't that just the sweetest little quilt? Cheerful, bright, scrappy, much like Janet herself. And now we're going to start basting it into place. There's a question about the backing. Let's take it now. I probably don't need my glasses on to read the screen. Maureen, will the seam on the backing land between both quilts? That's a really good question, Maureen. There are actually two seams in the backing, so there's going to be a seam on each quilt and it is not going to be perfectly centered. If you wanted that seam to be centered, you'd have to do a bit of pre-measuring beforehand and probably marking where along that backing you're going to place your quilts. And that can be done for various reasons. I do it sometimes. I lay a pin, you know, I would have this laid out on the floor and lay pins where the top of quilt number one needs to be so that the seam falls where I intend it to, where the top of quilt number two needs to be and so forth, because obviously I can't see it. It's all rolled up. So you'd have to pre-plan that before loading. I did not, Janet does not care where the seams fall. So that makes it very easy for me. So now I'm going to baste three sides of this quilt, the left side, the top, and down the right. And I am using Isochord 100% poly thread in an eggshell color. Now when I do quilts that have um, multiple colors as this one does, there's a number of choices I could make for thread. I've chosen the eggshell because I want it to blend with these sashing areas. Certainly you could do pink, yellow, aqua, any number of shades. None of those are wrong choices. I just prefer the subtle look. I prefer the quilting to take the back seat. So I've gone with that lighter color so that it's not distracting in these solid sashing areas. Just a matter of preference. So I'm just running a line of basting stitch within my seam allowance area up the left side. You could certainly do this with a larger basting stitch. I just don't bother to change stitch length. This is what I will be quilting with and so I just use it for the basting as well. And I have a stitch length of 12 turned on right now. My machine has channel locks which just means a magnet goes onto my quilting machine rail. So right now I've got the horizontal lock on so that I'll get a perfectly straight line. So I have visually lined up the top of my quilt with my red snapper, but that um, perfectly straight quilted line, I'll also adjust the quilt as I go to be straight with that. If you don't have that option, then lining it up with the top of the, um, your, your roller or your red snapper system will work as well. Something will have a straight edge up here, leader, roller, something. But this is another step in the process of creating a square quilt. I know that I have a straight line along the top. I suppose you could even measure the distance from the leader and drop some pins in. That would help keep it really straight too, if you don't have the channel lock option. And now I've got the vertical one on, so I'm getting a perfectly straight vertical line. So I know I have a 90 degree corner at the top. And I know I have a straight line down this side. And just like that, three sides of my quilt are secure. And by the way, I did put a very pale pink thread on the backing of this quilt. Uh, yeah, you can see this side. So my backing is pale pink with hot pink dots. I thought eggshell was a bit high contrast to that, so I put a pale pink on the bottom. Again, just personal preference, but I certainly like to keep my top and bottom threads pretty close. I don't want, you know, deep aqua or hot pink poking through my white areas on the top, so they're pretty close in shade. Okay, a couple more things. Our side clamps, these also are by Red Snapper. Um, I purchased their whole system. But what I like about them particularly is how long they are. Rather than having clamps pulling at two points, I've got this long, even tension on the side of my quilt. So 
I'm okay with whatever brand does that. That's the feature I'm looking for. I see there's dust on my... Clearly my studio needs a good cleaning. Anyone volunteering? Anyway, got my clamp on the side and it, it is not pulling. It's only holding this just smooth enough to not wrinkle. So I'm not putting huge amounts of tension on the quilt. And I'll show you in a minute an easy way to gauge that. If I put my fingers, which side of the camera here, if I put my fingers underneath the quilt and push up, I should be able to grab my fingers. It is not so tight this way or from side to side that it's like a drum. It's still pretty malleable. I've only got enough tension to keep it smooth. And then one last thing is my magnetic clamps on the front. And this secures my fourth side so that nothing will move. And that's one more step in getting a square quilt. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna start quilting, but if you have any questions about that loading process, feel free to type them in. And after I'm done one pass, um, we'll stop and talk about them. I'm gonna do one more thing and I'll show you guys. I don't think I've ever done this on YouTube before. I am going to change my foot on my machine to a spoon foot. I don't know if the close camera will show this, Dave, it probably will. Yes, here's my spoon foot. Can you see it's just shaped like a little dish? And what I've got on this quilt is some bulky seam allowances and also some seam allowances are pressed one way and some are pressed another. And if I use my regular hopper foot, that kind of bumps against them and pushes them. And I don't like that because that messes with the nice straight lines of these seams. So what my spoon foot will do is just sail right over those joins and those bulky seams. Some machines have a clear foot, which I kind of envy. My foot is black and not clear. So I'm giving up a certain amount of visibility in order to have this. So this would not work well for a design that required precision, you know, meeting up at points, because I just can't see that well. But for the design I'm doing today, it will be just fine. So I'm quilting a design that I call coffee beans. There are no coffee beans anywhere in it. But the first fabric that I did it on, the quilt that I first did it on, the fabric had coffee beans in various ways. So that's how it got named. Um, I just placed, are you seeing me on the large camera? There we go. Other side if you could. There we go. All I'm doing is I have a yardstick and I'm just putting it under my strap to hoist this up a bit. What's happening otherwise is my long arm right under here is bumping against my clamp and I can feel that when I get to the edge of my quilt. Can you see how that jerks? And that will mess with my quilting, obviously. So the easy fix for that is to just put something long and straight, curtain rod, yardstick, piece of wood that lifts this up just a little. And you can, you can move this back and forth depending on how much lift you need. Perfect. And on we go. I love about this design. It's very organic maybe is the best description. In other words, it's not it's not in rows. There's no hard and fast organization to it. I can make my circles larger or smaller, um, end them up wherever I want to, and I'm liking that because it enables me to on purpose stitch down some of these bulky seams that otherwise might bubble up a little bit after this is quilted. I won't be able to catch all of them because there's a lot of seams, but right here, for example, see how I just stitched right over that red and pink seam? And it just helps it to lay down more smoothly. So I was thinking of that when I chose this design. I was thinking of one that would allow me to really 
direct where I want the quilting to lay. If you needed any convincing about why I love freehand quilting so much, that would be one of the reasons, is that I have the ultimate control over where the quilting lies. If this was a digital design, it would just be what it is. And whatever size I pick, it's gonna be that way for the whole quilt. But because I'm working freehand, I can make those decisions on the fly while I'm quilting. Here again, I just, right over this little seam allowance, I can decide to quilt right close to that and it keeps it nice and smooth and flat. I love that level of control. my spoon foot does such a great job of just skimming over the top of any bulky areas. I love this little foot. It is a trooper. I promised I would tell you as I quilt more places that you can find me if you just want more quilting info. Um, there's a couple of them. One of them is just easy listening. I have a podcast and it's called Measure Twice, Cut Once. And it is sometimes just me, but more often it is an interview with someone else who is a crafty, usually a quilt maker, um, that has some kind of crafty pursuits and a story to tell. So that is called Measure Twice, Cut Once. You can find it most easily by just going to podcast.stitchedbysusan.com and you'll see all the episodes there. If you have not listened to podcasts, I encourage you to give it a try. They are a perfect match for quilters who are often working in the quiet with just their sewing machines humming in their ears. You can find all kinds of things on podcasts, all kinds of genres, whatever your listening pleasure is. And let's see, what else? Coming up fairly soon, I'm launching another session of my freehand quilting masterclass. So that is a really intensive dive into this style of quilting, quilting entirely freehand across a quilt top. Most of it being edge to edge work like this, a little bit of custom applications as well. And also talking about two other aspects. One is, how I practice and how you can too, that really rapidly advances your skill and your control at the long arm machine. And then the other emphasis is on how I design quilting designs like this, the features that I look for, the kinks and quirks that I work out that make it easy to remember, that make it look graceful on a quilt top, that enable you to move freely around the quilt top. So it's really, much less about art and more about 
learning the anatomy of a design, learning what makes it work well, what things do not work well, and how to change them. So I have a strong emphasis on that because I really encourage quilters to develop their own original designs. I know I find inspiration for mine in all kinds of places. This particular one was inspired from a piece of fabric, which I know will come as no surprise to you. Lots of good ideas come from pieces of fabric. But I've gotten some off. Um, hotel carpets is one of my favorites. They're often very organic, very wavy, very textural designs. One of my very favorites came directly off the back of a diner, like the upholstery in a diner where my husband and I were eating. So you can find inspiration in all kinds of places. And I love to show how that can just be translated into something that you can quilt. So let's see, I haven't told you where to find that. Easiest place to find information is on my website, stitchedbysusan.com. And there's a tab for classes. And the freehand quilting masterclass is listed there. And there's a ton of information. There's actually a syllabus of um, all the content that's in all the modules. So if you want to know all about it, that is the place to go. I'm also in the process of rolling out a monthly membership. So for those who, again, love this style of quilting, want more connection with me and want more details about how to quilt these designs than I typically give in these live and unscripted shows, like want them actually broken down and all the tips and draw them on a whiteboard. That's the sort of thing that's going to be in that monthly membership, along with some quilt alongs, um, some guest speakers and teachers, live question and answer sessions, all those kinds of things. So at the moment, that membership is just available to students who have previously taken my master class. They are kindly giving it a test run for me to make sure all the moving parts are working smoothly. But if that interests you, um, the best way to know more about when it's coming is to sign up for my newsletter. And that too can be done at my website. There will be a pop-up within a couple seconds of opening the website that invites you. Well, I've always got a free project going on there. And whatever that invitation is, that will also get you on my newsletter. So that's the easiest way to find out more details about that. And that will be going to the public within just a few weeks. That membership. And here we are nearly at the end of our pass. So if you have any questions, great time to be typing them in. And I will disassemble all my apparatus and then have a look at your questions and have a sip of coffee. I've been watching some other quilters online recently. You know, with little reels now happening on Instagram, you get these little snippets of what others are doing and of what their processes are. And I'm kind of surprised, honestly, at how many quilters work without basting the perimeter as I do. And I gotta tell you, for me, that is a non-negotiable. I just do not see how you can possibly get a square quilt when it's all said and done, if you don't establish the edges. You know, I don't know, maybe they have other methods and I don't know what they are, but I just find it interesting to see that. The quilts that I'm working on today are quite casual, so I'm not, I'm really just using my visual guides of are the lines straight? You know, is it lined up with my roller bar? Sometimes I will actually stretch a tape measure across and be um, watching my numbers as I'm advancing. Usually on larger quilts I do that or ones that have any bias or any issues. For this one, I'm doing it very much by eye and using my channel locks. Still, with just those two things together, I can confidently say these quilts will definitely be within a quarter inch of square when they're done. And for most quilts, that is perfectly adequate. That's better than most quilts get, let's be honest.
and because I have my channel lock, my straight line on, and I could see that my quilt was veering a bit wider, I'm actually pushing a little bit of it into the center and I'm gonna take up that excess as I'm quilting to keep my perimeter edge nice and straight. That's important to me. I'll do a little more yet. There we go. While I'm over here, I'll go ahead and put my stretcher on this side. Then I'll baste and stretch the other side, and then we'll chat for a minute about some of your questions. Just having a little trouble getting my fabric into the clamp. It's got a little wrinkle going on there, but I got it. Persevere. Just as a little side tip, I don't know if you saw me just clipping some threads there. The, some of the fabrics that were in this I think were bad for fraying and I'm seeing quite a few little fabric-y threads. I mean, not, not dozens and dozens, but some. However, when I see one that is white, that is a sewing thread, I do not pull it, I cut it. Um, that's something to be very cautious of when you're quilting on a quilt top. Don't just yank on every thread. If it's a sewing thread, it needs to be trimmed and not pulled. You do not want to risk undoing bits of the quilt. And again, I'm pushing just a little bit of my quilt back into the center. This coffee bean design is a great one for taking up any little bits of excess like that. Really, any, any curvy or circular design will really help. And it's not severe by any means. That will be really easy to ease in. Okay, let's get some clamps and magnets on and then we'll chat. Again, just having a little trouble getting my fabric into that clamp. Sometimes a pin helps. It's a very narrow little channel that the fabric has to fit into. And the edge of this piece of fabric was torn. And so you know how that rumples just a little bit. So smoothing it in with a pin is just the ticket. Perfect. Okay, and the magnets, and we're good to go. Okay, let me get my coffee cup in hand. Stand back from the quilt and take my glasses off so I can see. <laughs> oh boy, the joys of being live. Pretty funny. Okay, apparently there are several good comments in a row. They're all. Oh, okay, here we go. Sue, what do you use for your side <laughs> stretchers? Ah, yeah, I see, Sue, what's happening? Hilarious <laughs> side stretchers. Okay, they are they are um, the Red Snapper brand, and I have I think 16 inch ones, and they're on my resources page, and I'll try and add them after this episode as well. Add all my um, favorite tools at the bottom with links. Like I said earlier, though, it's not so much what brand they are that matters, it's that they be long. That's what I like, having that even tension all the way along the edge of my quilt. So there are other brands that do that. I just ordered the whole Red Snapper system and they were part of it. I noticed you started on the left, is there a reason? So actually I started on what is my right. And is there a reason? No, there's not. I just happened to be basting that one last and so I just was on that side so started there. You'll see when I start my next pass I always alternate which side I start my passes on so it doesn't matter which one is first because I'm going to do the other one next. Um, I alternate them because some designs are a little bit directional and it keeps them from looking like they're all you know blowing in a wind across your quilt. So alternating directions helps to keep that smoother. Any more questions? Oh Laurel I'm sorry. Does doing two quilts on one backing only work when floating? No, I think it would work if you rolled them both on, Laurel, too. Just be darn sure that you've got enough backing. 
before you roll them on. <laughs> Make sure you've done your pre-measuring. Susie, love how your top coordinates with the background quilt. Did you plan that? Nope, I sure didn't. The one that's behind me is one of my quilts and it's, it's a great one for having behind me in these videos. So it's been hanging for a few weeks. The one on the long arm just happened to match. Lynn, Susan, I've had my long arm about six weeks. How much wider should your backing be than the quilt top, please? I recommend to my customers three to four inches. You're seeing that you need some sort of side clamp to hold it, right? And ideally your machine does not bump into that on the sides. I only have about, not quite three inches on each side of this one. So as you saw, I put my yardstick to kind of lift my clamp so you can get away with a little bit less. I think three to four inches though is the minimum on each side and top and bottom as well. Susan, have you ever tried or used stencils? Okay, clarify what you mean by stencils. Do you mean stencils to trace a design? Stencils as in rulers? Or stencils as in pantographs? Clarify what you mean and I'll come back to that, Phyllis. Northern Sioux, can previous delinquent students hop back into master class? Yes, they can. Your lessons are yours for always. So your login information will be the same and if you have any trouble with it, email us and we will help you. Info at stitchedbysusan.com. Um, yeah, short. Okay, just a second here. So the answer to my last question, or this particular question. Okay, sorry about that. We lost sound for a second, apparently. Jacqueline is asking, do you do this full time? That's what I have been doing the last few years, Jacqueline. At the moment, I'm transitioning into doing more teaching, online teaching, actually then quilting. So my quilting now is about a third of my time. And, but I sure do love it. Sure do love it. Debbie, love that you also quilt in bare feet. Okay, didn't even realize that was on camera, but yes, I do quilt in bare feet. Lisa, I'd like to see you draw this design on a piece of paper so that I can figure out how to do it. Well, Lisa, that's kind of what my monthly membership that I'm in the process of launching is designed to do. So it gives a few things. I do draw it on a whiteboard. I also offer doodle sheets that you can slip between, um, you know, a... a, a a see-through, gosh, the word escapes me. But anyway, you can draw over it with a wet dry marker and practice in that way. And then it also offers a demo of the quilting, like a close-up and on a solid fabric with a contrasting thread and all the things so you can see it. So I'm offering basically lessons for different designs. It's impossible to show that level of detail when I'm working on a quilt because it is always, you know, printed or multicolored fabrics and it's just not the best platform for it. So that's what that membership is really designed to, to answer. Yes, and Mr. Producer is reminding me, it is coming. Uh, it's not here yet. My students are test driving it for me at the moment. So in the next few weeks, I hope to be rolling that out to all of you who are interested. Phyllis, stencils that you lay on an area and then pouncing. Ah, okay. I have done that, Phyllis. I think that lends itself more toward doing uh, custom quilting because the stencils are usually small, right? So in specific blocks or borders or areas, what I do much more of is this idea of edge to edge across a whole quilt top. So that's my, my area that I love and usually what I show in these live and unscripted episodes. And part of what I wanna show is that Anybody can do that, right? You don't have to have a pattern to follow. You can do this freehand. That's what my class is all about. Jackie, I struggled doing an all over quilting that ignores the piecing grid. Did you when you started? Absolutely, because you're kind of training your eye to not look at colors and seams, but to look you know, at the whole, to be looking at where you've quilted and where you're quilting next. Um, so yes, that's a matter of getting comfortable. A design like this that has some corners where you can pause is advantageous because the you know no shame in pausing to figure out where you're going to go next absolutely janine do you ever use rulers yes i do and some of the live and unscripted episodes in the past do have rulers in them they're not uh, they're not highly detailed i don't do a lot of high-end custom work usually in these shows but i have done several that that use uh, a straight ruler have i done any curved i don't know but i've done straights for sure and yes i do it in my personal work quite a bit mm -hmm. We're just conferring a little bit because it is live. 
Laurel is asking, will the membership be part of the masterclass or separate? It is a separate thing, Laurel, because people can choose one or the other and all the designs that are in the membership are different designs than are in the masterclass. So it's different content as well. It's just delivered in bite-sized monthly pieces. Okay, is that all our questions? Mr. Producer is looking at me with questions in his eyes. I'm wondering if I explained something unclearly. Let me roll back through that in my head. Okay, we've gotten it clarified. Sorry, I just, I, sometimes my tongue does not work the way my, you know, in conjunction with my head. So sometimes I have to clarify. Okay, we ready to start quilting or are there more questions? Yeah. That's it for questions. Okay, let's begin again. Need the glasses. Okay, and remember I said, don't clip the white threads or don't pull them, clip them. And also I said, I do alternate starting sides. So my last pass, I started in the upper right hand corner to me. This one I'm going to start on the left and work toward the right. That just helps to keep things looking organic and smooth. It does not matter on all designs. It probably doesn't matter on this one, but I just do that habitually and then I never forget. So again, I'm just locking my thread. I pulled my bobbin thread up and I'm just locking my thread with a few stitches um, along that basted edge and then launching right back into my quilting. I'm gonna pause for one second here at a corner and I'm gonna put my yard sticks on both ends to make sure I don't bump up against my side stretchers. So many things to remember and sometimes when I'm talking, I don't recall them all. There we go, now we're all set. I'm quilting today with the stitch regulator on. And if you can hear the machine noise, you know, that means the motor is slowing up and speeding down with my speed of movement. And I tell this story a lot. My, my preference when I'm quilting by myself is usually to stitch in constant mode. So a constant and fixed speed. I think that it's smoother and certainly it's more relaxing for me to do. It's just not always easy to do it while talking. But I want you guys to see what that is like and what the advantages of that might be. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it in constant mode now. So what that means is my, when I press start, now my machine is going to move at a fixed rate and it's up to me to move it consistently and smoothly because my movements are going to determine the stitch length. Can you hear that? Now the motor sound is fixed and not changing. So now I have to pay attention to making really smooth movements. But on the plus side, I feel like I can get smoother curves having this constant speed on. There's something about that motor um, because it's always making adjustments there's just a tiny bit of almost resistance. And stitching in this constant mode, my machine just moves like butter. I'm giving you options here. I would not recommend this if it's a brand new design that's new to you because it's just too many things to think about. But once you're familiar with the design, give it a try. And I'm stopping because I actually ran out of bobbin thread. And my typical method is to just go until it runs out and then change the bobbin. I don't have a bobbin you know, thread counter or revolution counter going on. And what I'm doing now is just undoing a couple of inches because there wasn't tension on that bobbin thread the last few inches. So I'm just going to undo to the last corner. Last time I had a sharp point. And then I will start a new thread and that will be very unobtrusive, very unnoticeable at that point. I'll do a few lock stitches and that'll be that. And I do have a freestanding bobbin winder. So 
What I typically do when I'm working on a quilt is every time I put a new bobbin in my machine, I also put a new one onto the winder so it's ready for me. So I've got one over there ready for me right now. And I just drop my blue seam ripper right where that join is going to be so that I don't have to hunt for it when I come back. And the amount of time that I'm off camera is how long it takes me to grab my fresh bobbin and put my first one on to reload. I know lots of quilters love to use the pre-wound bobbins. That's absolutely fine too. I just, I like using the same thing top and bottom. It's very economical and I don't find that it takes much time at all. And then I move my blue seam ripper. <laughs> but here it is. So again, I'm just pulling up my bobbin thread, hanging on to both of them, and I'm stitching about a quarter inch over my last few stitches of my last bobbin, putting four or five nice closely spaced lock stitches in there. Leave the tails hang for the moment, because if you trim them right now, they're apt to pull out. So leave them hang for a moment. I've got it back unregulated while I fiddle with this. And pause at a corner and clip those tails and no one will ever be any the wiser. I'm gonna stay unregulated now because it's just easier to talk when I'm not also thinking about machine speed. Notice in the close-up camera how often I'm able to adjust where my stitching falls to tame some of these bulky seam allowances that otherwise want to pop up. There's an example right there. I went very close to a seam intersection. You don't even have to stitch right on it, but within about an eighth of an inch, and that will help that to lay so nicely flat. I do think that achieving a square quilt and also achieving a flat quilt you know, and final result is it's cumulative. It's it's the sum of doing a number of different things. But this is one of the things that helps the quilt to lay flat and smooth when it's finished is quilting down as many of those seam allowances, especially the ones that want to pop up as you possibly can. And that's the beauty of a freehand design that's got the freedom to, you know, fudge a little bit.
appreciate those who might just be joining now. I'll give a brief recap of what today's projects are and what equipment I'm using. This is a live and unscripted show, meaning it's being streamed live with all its oopses and all its bob and run outs intact in real time. And I'm working on two quilts that are identical. And so Janet, who made them, provided me one long piece of backing so that I'm able to quilt one and then load the other one right after it. Saving loading time because I only have to load one time. So the order of events today is going to be, I'm gonna quilt this first one entirely and then go ahead and load the second one so that you can see that process. But I will not quilt the second one on air. And I'm quilting on my Gamel Elevate today. I am currently in regulated stitch mode, meaning the motor is adjusting, speeding up and slowing down with my movements. I'm using Hobbs 80-20 batting, 80% cotton, 20% poly. It's my favorite workhorse of a batting. And I'm using Isocord 100% poly thread. And I have eggshell loaded on the top and a pale pink loaded on the bottom, just because the backing is um, a fairly deep pink. And my preference was to not have the eggshell thread against that. There's not a wrong or a right there. Either one would have been satisfactory, but I chose to load a pale pink on the bottom. So, and the design I'm quilting is entirely freehand, and I call it coffee bean. You might have guessed by now, I love my coffee. So I'm sure that influenced my decision too. But one of the reasons I chose it is because there's so many um, seam intersections on this quilt and I want them to lay as flat as I possibly can. And this curvy design with circles that I can easily make a little bigger or a little smaller, even that little kind of knob I can make bigger or smaller or, or fall different places. It's just a very versatile design in allowing me to quilt over or as near to many of those seam intersections as I can. And that's going to help them lay beautifully flat in the finished quilt. I also have got my spoon foot loaded. You can see it's kind of shaped like a little dish or a little spoon. And that too makes my quilting job a lot easier because it just coasts right over top of some of these bulky seam intersections without kind of pushing them out ahead of the hopper foot. And I really like that. Great time to be typing in your questions if you have them. I will unload all my apparatus and advance the quilt while you do that. I always float my quilt tops and if you're not familiar with that term, that means that the front edge of the quilt, Dave, I can't see my screen. The front edge of the quilt is just hanging, floating, if you will. So the backing is rolled at the top end, rolled at the bottom end, but my batting and my top are just floating. So that's why I need the basting, the magnets, etc. That's what's stabilizing my quilt. I prefer this way because it's so fast and I've done it enough times and kind of worked out a system that I can still get a really nice and flat and square quilt without having to roll both ends of the top. And I don't say that's right or wrong, either way. Different quilters have their preferences. By all means, experiment. I'm just explaining to you why I choose this way and why I like it so much. Again, I'm looking for errant threads and if I don't know if they're sewing threads or fabric fibers, I'm trimming them with the scissors rather than pulling. I do not want to undo any of the stitching of the quilt. And when I do my basting, I'm really taking care to get a perfectly straight line on the side. If my the edge of my quilt is bulging just a little, that's what you saw me doing was kind of pushing some of that toward the center because I can ease that in super easily and create a lovely straight edge on the side of the quilt instead of making my basting, you know, wave with the quilt a little bit. Every quilt has a little bit of that because fabric shifts. It really can. It, it stretches, it distorts. If there's any, you know, even just being folded or hung, that can happen. So 
This is just part of the cumulative process of creating a square finished result. And I just run a line of stitching within a seam allowance edge or a seam allowance width of the edge of the quilt and then that will all fall inside the binding. It does not need to be taken out at the end. And in fact, for most of my clients, I actually um, run a rotary cutter along the edge and trim it up for them so that it's ready to bind. There's a nice straight edge and all that stitching, I know, I'm confident, will fall right within the seam allowance of the binding. It's a beautiful thing. So after this, we just have one more short pass. It's not a large quilt. So again, we're working on two today. I have a really long backing. So I'm going to go ahead and quilt this one all the way to the finish line and then load the second one so you can see what that looks like to load them one right after another. And I will not quilt the second one on air. But I will take any questions you have about that process of loading two. It's just, it's really a time saver because you only have one load instead of two. And it's also a fabric saver. Um, I recently did some quilts for another client and, and she makes a lot of charity kind of lap sized quilts, like just sitting in a chair lap size. So, you know, 50 inches or so. And she actually sent me four with a flannel backing. So one right after the other. And so I only had to load one time for four quilts, which was awesome. You do have to at some point think about the size of roll that fabric backing is going to make because it was flannel, it got pretty fluffy, but because the quilts were small, it was manageable. Okay, let me move Lucy to the side. My long arm is named Lucy, by the way, and we'll chat. And I will show you, this time instead of putting my full-size clamp, do you wanna put this end camera on, Dave, for a moment? There it comes. Oh, you can't really see it there either. You can a little bit. See, there's a jog in my fabric right here. My clamp with its teeny tiny narrow channel is not gonna work well there. So I am just gonna put my single clamps on. Needs must sometimes. I'm just gonna make them very gentle on the edge of my fabric. So it's almost just the weight of the clamp holding it. There's no, there's no pulling or stretching there. I know you can't really see what I'm doing, but now I'm just putting my yardstick under those clamps to hold them up a little bit out of the way. There we go. And yardstick at the other end. And then I'm ready for questions. There we go. Let me grab my coffee. Coffee's important. And no, it's not hot anymore. But it still is wet. <laughs> okay, questions? Rosemary, hi Susan, Kamloops BC. Sorry I came in late. This membership, please explain again. Would love to learn these different patterns you do. Sure, I will briefly. I don't want to make a huge sales pitch out of this YouTube episode, but coming in the next few weeks is a monthly subscription membership and each month will have new content. So sometimes it will be new designs, sometimes it will be guest teachers, sometimes it will be live Q and A's, sometimes it'll be a quilt along where we work on a project at the same time. Um, a variety of things, but several new things each month. And when I do teach a new design, it's going to be in depth. So it's going to be drawing it, talking about how I developed it and what changes I made or how it evolved, and then quilting it on solid fabric with contrasting thread so you can really see what I'm doing and so that it walks you step by step through that design. So that's what's coming in the membership. And um, if, you're, if you sign up for my newsletter, you'll get be the first to know basically. Um, when that rolls out to the public. Currently, my masterclass students are test driving it for me. Boondock Crafters, love the name. <laughs> Your new upcoming classes, can they be adapted to a sit-down Sweet 16? I cannot stand to quilt, so I have a smaller setup. You know, I do have students who've been in my masterclass who do use sit-downs and even a couple who have a domestic machine, and they tell me that they adapt quite well. There are some that are row-based, which maybe don't adapt as well because you don't typically quilt in rows on a sit down machine. But a lot of them have adapted it to being, you know, done in a large square, for example. So some of the designs need to be scaled down because when you're working with moving the fabric, perhaps you can't do as large sweeping movements, but the same design and thought processes absolutely still apply. The same designs can still apply. 
They just may require a little adaptation, and I'm happy to chat about that. Forgive and forget. Susan, please share what tools you have on top of your long arm. Sure, I can do that for a second. Um, can I pull Lucy into the frame? And I'll set down my coffee. And I'm just going to be super quick because I don't want to be long about this either. But a couple of my favorites, my blue Solo cup. My machine happens to have a peg on the top and that's where I've affixed it. I just cut an X in the bottom. Other quilters have a cup that they've glued on somewhere, but it's just for my thread tails. I keep my seam ripper and usually a marking pen or two tucked in there. It's nearly full right now of thread. This is a little tiny baby pin cushion that is stuck on there for permanent and it has a couple of the needles that I use like to knot and bury threads for example or a different size of stitching needle and I just keep them handy in that tiny pin cushion. This is a little tiny magnet and I use this for making sure that my needle is straight in. When you put this on the front of your needle you can tell by how the magnet points. So if I need to make any adjustments to that needle this magnet helps me do that and it lives right there. And my little scissors snips live on a little peg right here and that's all the tools that I have on the front of my machine but it's nice to have them within arm's reach always those are my tools Mindy how long have you been long arm quilting I got my first Lucy in 2015 so seven years going on eight but you know time like years is not really a measurement there's lots of people that have been quilting for that length of time but I did do it for my job for a few of those years so I've done well over a thousand freehand quilts in that period of time. Okay, that's it for questions. So we started on the left last time, my left. This time I'm gonna start on the right. I absolutely love working on scrappy quilts like this. Jenna and I are friends in real life and we um, are a member of the same little quilting group. We do retreats together and so forth. So when I quilt her scrappy quilt, I get to see fabrics that I recognize, some even that are scraps of my quilts. Apparently there's another question I need to get. What is your brand of seam ripper? Mine dulls so quickly. Mine is a Dritz and I wouldn't say, well, I don't know what you mean by quilt quickly. I, um, no, other side. I do replace mine fairly often. Like I buy these by the half dozen and I probably go through a couple a year. That's up to you, but I usually keep a new one and I use it from time to time. And if I'm feeling a difference, I toss the old one and get the new one. It makes life so much easier. It's like having a sharp knife in your kitchen. The work goes so much easier when you have a sharp seam ripper, but it is just the Dritz brand. It's not an expensive one. Okay, on we go. I've lock stitched my thread. I think I did. I'll do it again just to be sure. So once more, this is my coffee beans design. There are no coffee beans in it, but the first quilt I did it on had coffee bean fabrics. So that's where the name came from. It has a couple of great features. It's quick, which is a nice thing. It gives me really good practice making circles. And it's very adaptable. In other words, it allows me to make them larger or smaller or shift their shape a little bit, which is really advantageous in this quilt because I have a lot of seam intersections that I'm trying to get to lay down nice and flat. One other thing, which is not a problem on this quilt, but sometimes is, is when you have a lot of excess fabric that you need to be easing in. You know, a, a fluffy border or a fluffy center that's got some excess. Doing circles like this is really helpful for easing in extra fabric. So it's a good design to have in your back pocket. Something that is circular. And my other secret weapon is this spoon foot. It just, sails really smoothly over the top of any of these bulky seam allowances. Different machines have different types of hopper foots, but on my machine, my hopper foot literally hops up and down a little bit with each stitch. So if I try to go over bulky seam allowances like this, it tends to bump them and get pushed a little bit off of straight. So this little spoon foot is a lifesaver for me. And there's a little bit of easing in this area. I don't know if you recall when I was basting, I pushed some excess into the middle of the fabric. So I'm using my left hand. I'll pause a minute and show you. The nose of my long arm is right here. 
So I'm using my left hand to almost stretch my fabric just a little bit and I'm putting weight here and there just to pull it under the needle with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, without any pleats. It works really well. If you're not comfortable quilting with one hand, you can do the same thing, the same effect by putting something lightweight on both sides of your long arm rail. So like two cans of chicken broth or two water bottles or something like that and that will do the same thing. It will just pull in that excess evenly without any pleats. You can see I'm making circles in all different sizes. I think it adds interest to the quilting, but for sure it's helpful when I'm trying to fill in these different areas. Just make a larger or a smaller circle, whatever fits. Something that's kind of second nature to me that I don't even think about, but you might be interested in, is also where my eyes are when I'm quilting this. And I realize my eyes are not watching my needle, not ever. My eyes are always out where I'm going next. I think it helps quilt much more smoothly. I think it's like driving. If you're looking at the nose of your car, you know, all your adjustments are going to be too much, too abrupt. I think it's the same way with quilting. You've got to look out a little further ahead to keep things smooth and, and relax about it a little bit your eyes are fixed on where you're going and your hands just naturally follow. And I'm just thinking about it more as I'm quilting and it's really true, my eye is never on my needle and where it's bouncing up and down. My eye is always out ahead where I'm planning to quilt next. And even it's taking short, quick glances across my quilt top to see where, in general, in the big picture, I need to go next. Although that, I feel like, is a skill that you develop. And if that's not coming easily, you just pause at these corners and decide where you're going next. Another nice feature of this design, it has good uh, points so that you can pause to look up and judge where you're going. You can pause to move your feet if you need to. Yeah, my hopper foot is just sailing over that seam. It wasn't pressed quite as smoothly as maybe it could be. But you know what, that will all come out in the wash, quite literally. My concern is just that I don't quilt a funky pleat in it because that won't come out in the wash. So my little spoon foot is the perfect solution for that. definitely recognizing a couple of fabrics that are in some of my quilts. I love that. My mom was a very traditional quilter and we lived in northern Canada when I was a child and you know even in that time too quilt stores were not what they are today. You didn't just go shopping for your quilt. Certainly we didn't. And so many of her quilts were made from the leftovers of our clothes because she made a lot of our clothes too. So I, I still have some of those quilts and I absolutely love looking back at them. Those fabrics are so nostalgic. You can say, oh, this was my summer dress the year I went into sixth grade or this was my mom's apron. 
I do have a soft spot for scrappy quilts. There's so many stories in them. I recently posted a short reel that was just like a less than 10 second clip of me quilting on the long arm and a gentleman posted a response and he was quite incensed. He was like, that is cheating. Quilts are made by hand. That's how my mother made quilts. So I'm curious what you all think. I mean, you're here, you're here knowing that it's machine quilting. So I assume that you're okay with it. But I'm curious how you think about that. Like, is it an entirely different skill? Or is it just taking advantage of technology the same way that women today have, you know, electric washing machines? And toasters? And it is a fascinating question to me because, as I said, my mom was a very traditional quilter and that's how I learned to make quilts. Um, I learned to sew on a treadle sewing machine. I learned to quilt by hand. But I still don't think this is cheating. Just saying. You can see how I'm fitting in a couple of small ones just because I thought that area was a little too large to leave unquilted. So I tucked in a couple of small swirls. And because I have swirls elsewhere in my quilting design, they just fit in there seamlessly. And one last slim pass and this one will be finished. There's the end right there. Now again, I'm using kind of my visual cues, you know, are my seams lined up straight front to back? Is my edge here, as far as I can see, running straight with the rail? And then I'm going to underline that and make sure it is so by using my channel locks and if I didn't have those channel locks I would seriously consider pinning at this point to keep things straight and even and from stretching out um, that's a matter for whatever you feel comfortable with I pinned many 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 quilts you know before I did the basting for the first couple of years until I got comfortable sort of eyeballing it and making adjustments on the fly so you do whatever your comfort level is. But I do have my channel lock on now, so I know that I'm getting a perfectly straight line. I know that I have 90 degree corners, and so I know this quilt is square. Now because it's, you know, fabric and thread, certainly you could pull on it and pull it out of square, but I have made it as square as it is possible to be for a little casual quilt. And there seems to be a little extra in this corner, so I am, in fact, just zhuzhing that into the middle. And I'll take up that little bit of excess as I quilt. And even here, remember I said in the middle when there was excess, I used the nose of my machine? I'm doing it here too. I'm actually putting some weight with my thumb on the area that's already been basted and stitched and that pulls this area that's not yet been stitched under the needle a little faster because I can see there's a little bit of excess here, not very much, but if I didn't do anything, that would push up and I would end up with a problem. And if I do just this one little thing of putting a little tension on what's already been stitched, that pulls it right under the needle, smooth as anything.
just that simply. All right, let's get our side stretchers on. And again, I'm dealing with a seam that's been torn, so there's just a little bit of ruffling. I've got a pin in my hand to kind of help me, I think, possibly. If I get it started, I can just usually smooth it in with a pin, but it's being a little stubborn today. It is being a little stubborn. Oh my goodness. As I mentioned, it's a very narrow little channel in these stretchers. Less than an eighth of an inch. There we go. We got it. Persevere. And sometimes when I don't feel like persevering that hard, I just put my single clamps on as I did on this end a few moments ago on the last pass. Either way works. Just be careful that you don't put too much tension on them when they're the single little clamps. Then you get a little scalloped edge. Nobody wants that. We got it. All right, we're all set. Now, which side did we start on last time? Right, left, right, we need to start on the left. Okay, let's take a few questions and comments and I'll get another sip in. Wet my whistle a little bit. Such a glare on my glasses, isn't there? Diana, have you quilted paper pieced quilts and do you have any tips or suggestions for those? Oh boy, that, that's a big question. I've done a couple of Judy Niemeyer quilts, which are foundation paper pieced they're usually cut or very often they're custom work um, and have stitching in the ditch but they don't have to be and i don't think you have to quilt them custom i think you could literally do this um, you end up with seam allowances that are always pressed to one side but that's not really a problem but you might need to take some of these same precautions for dealing with bulky seams like perhaps a spoon foot yeah Neris, I recently quilted a large quilt on my domestic sewing machine and there was a lot of stitch ripping. I tried your method and it was so much easier than the way I used to do it. So I'm curious what method you applied to your domestic machine. I'd love if you would clarify that and know how that worked for you. Forgive and forget, hand quilting is therapeutic and ever so lovely, but time cost prohibitive if you have the luxury of mechanical options. And really options is the key word, right? If you love doing that or if you enjoy doing both, have at it for sure. Margaret, there's room for every kind of quilter and quilting, just like it's okay to walk, ride your bike, and drive a car. Or take your horse and buggy, you know? <laughs> Annabelle, I enjoy hand quilting for fun, but don't take away my long arm. He does not know that this is a whole different skill set to learn and perfect and deserves just as much respect as his mother's handwork. It, it is another skill, just like race car drivers are different from horse and buggy drivers. Yeah, for sure. Susan, finished is better than perfect, and that hand quilting wasn't perfect either. It's true. Mindy, I would never get into quilting if I had to do it by hand. I love machine quilting. I can appreciate handwork just not doing it. And I'm kind of with you, Mindy. That's what got me started on machine quilting on my domestic machine initially, is I lived in an area where I didn't have any friends that hand quilted and to quilt by myself, I'd be lucky if I got one quilt done a year. I mean, I'd be lucky and I wanted to make more quilts. So the answer for me was machine quilting, yeah. Jackie, the music is wonderful to accompany quilting. Is the album available? I'm sorry to tell you that it's not. And that's part of the reason we're able to use it is it's not copyrighted and produced publicly. So I'm sorry, you'll just have to come back to the show to enjoy it. We play it every week or every episode. Dana, my husband says quilting is like ballroom dancing. Hands, hips, feet, eyes all need to be moving and doing different things. He was a ballroom dance teacher for a little while. I love that analogy because that's really, really true. It's really true. <laughs> It is. Peggy, there are too many quilts that I want to make, so hand quilting's not an option for me. Life is too short. And everybody's entitled to their favorite way of making them. Annabelle, I keep watching you do the side clamps. I struggle a lot with them and have given up. I'll try again on the next quilt. I encourage you to do that. I will say mine were very tight and stiff and they loosened up over use, but we're talking of dozens of quilts of use. 
So, I mean, maybe sit and open and close and open and close and open and close them sometimes when you're watching Netflix just to, they just get a little bit looser and a little bit easier. And you saw me using the pins, that can be helpful too. Okay. One last sip, bottoms up, and we're ready to quilt. So this is our last pass on this little quilt. So again, and if you're just joining, today we're talking a little bit about loading two quilts on a single backing. The quilts are identical, they're little twins, but they wouldn't have to be, they just have to both coordinate with the backing. And it just really saves time to be able to load once and quilt two things. I'm having a rough time just pulling up my bobbin thread. And notice how my little, my little foot is collecting a whole bunch of lint. I find that fascinating because I use 100% poly thread because it is, they claim to be lint free. Imagine what that would look like if I was trying to use cotton thread. And that is why I love polyester thread. What you're seeing on the foot, you know, is exacerbated in the bobbin space too. The lint collects there as well. So in my opinion, poly thread is the only way to go for long arm quilting. You're making so many stitches that a cotton thread just produces an incredible amount of lint. Can you see there's a little excess in this area? So again, I'm using my left hand to just put a little tension on it over the nose of the long arm. That just helps to distribute it evenly. You're not really trying to stretch the fabric. You're just trying to help it feed under the hopper foot evenly to avoid any pleats. So all that excess, and there's not really that much of it, but there's a little, so it's illustrative. This is the way that you keep it from showing up in your finished product, is you distribute it evenly, and then it just disappears into the crinkles of a washed and used quilt. This design is one of my favorite examples of how your more everyday edge-to-edge -edge quilting can really help to elevate your skill if you're wanting to do custom or high-end quilting. And these circles are a great example. They absolutely do not need to be perfect for this quilting design. So that gives you room to play and experiment and, and get the hang of them and um, experiment with speeds and 
how you're moving around them. But if you do this with intentionality, I think that's the best word, instead of just swinging your long arm around them and hoping for the best, if you are focusing on making the roundest, plumpest circles you possibly can, I promise you that a whole quilt of this design will improve your circle quilting for sure. So then next time you want to quilt, you know, bubbles or pebbles on a quilt, your control is going to be that much better. And I think that is one of my favorite themes, quite honestly, in my masterclass is the fact that doing this very every day, almost utilitarian type of quilting does not have to be time wasted and you do not have to necessarily do specific practice pieces to learn a skill. You know, practice sandwiches that are dedicated just toward learning. You literally can learn these skills while producing quilts. And I think that's kind of remarkable. And I think my skill level is a testament to that. I don't know when I last quilted on something just for practice. I always try out my designs on quilts. So my method kind of is I draw them out a time or two on my um, plexiglass boards with a dry erase marker. I perhaps doodle them a little bit on paper. And sometimes if I have excess backing on my quilt, I'll load a little strip on one side and do a couple motifs just to make sure my scale is what I want it to be. And then I quilt it. And that's how I learn a design is by quilting it. And that's also how I figure out if there are things in it that I don't love that um, are not flowing smoothly or not allowing me to travel from one place to another easily. That's when I know to make the changes. And that, you can't always figure that out from doodling a design. You sometimes just have to start quilting it to figure that out. Or at least that's true for me. Okay, my glasses keep falling down. It's getting really annoying. I don't know if you can see me shoving them up my nose every 10 seconds. This whole business of needing glasses at all is just for the birds, isn't it? I'm very fortunate I've had good vision all my life until probably three or four years ago. And now glasses are required for quilting anyways. This fabric right here is from one of my quilts. Too, too fun to see these in Janet's project. Now I'm gonna do a little something here. I'm hoping that you can see on air. I'm seeing this little area, which is not necessarily huge, but the seams are really sticking up a little bit and I'm feeling like there's gotta be a way to make that lay down. So I am in fact going to go back in there and put a small circle, little swirl, just like that, that helps it to lay down. You know, that's entirely up to you as you're quilting. My kind of rule of thumb is I don't wanna leave any unquilted areas that are larger than the spacing of my quilting. So in other words, if my circles are, you know, if all the quilting lines in my circles are perhaps an inch to an inch and a half apart, then I don't want to leave quilted areas or unquilted areas that are any bigger than that. I don't know if I said that at all clearly. But as I'm quilting these circles, there are few spaces that are more than an inch or an inch and a quarter. So then I don't want to leave unquilted areas that are any bigger than that. That will start to stick out like a little pillow, you know? And right there, I'm fudging it and putting in an extra one. But again, I think crossing over a couple lines to squeeze in another swirl is less obvious to the eye than leaving a big pouch of unquilted area. Oh, and we're at a bobbin thread. Just like that. And once again, 
My method is to just let it run out. My machine does have a counter, but it involves, you know, estimating the revolutions of the bobbin and every time you change a different thread, it's not quite accurate. I, for me, that's just more work than it's worth. I just go till it runs out. And then I undo a little bit because the last couple of inches won't have had proper tension on them as it was coming to the end. And usually I undo to a corner, but as it happens in this one, let me move this aside so you can see a bit. Uh, my last corner is way back here, so I'm probably not gonna undo that far. Instead, I'm going to undo to where I'm crossing a seam allowance. The stitches are always more secure because they're going through more layers of fabric, so that's where I'm gonna put my lock stitches. They'll show less and they'll be nice and firm in that seam allowance. That's my reasoning anyways. But you definitely want to back up far enough that you're seeing good tension on the stitches. Right there is where I'm going to trim. Mr. Producer was kind enough to bring the bobbin so I don't have to go far. Just to where I can reach underneath the machine. I do have a TOA gauge for my bobbins and I do use it some of the time. Um, more often, I'm pretty confident about my bobbin winder that it's pretty accurate. And also, just over time, I've gotten quite attuned to my machine and I know what a good stitch looks like. And there are still times that my tension isn't quite right, but I'm pretty attuned to seeing when that's happening at the top. It'll be things like how the thread lays on the fabric or even things like in my little pigtail holders in the front, if the thread is doing funny wobbles there, like I know exactly what that should look like. If that doesn't feel comfortable to you, then use the TOA gauge. It's a great tool. I gotta figure out where I was in the design. Okay, yeah, we got it. Pausing to clip my threads. And no one will be any the wiser. That's buried very nicely in a little seam allowance. I'm way up close to the bar. I bet you probably can't even see me sewing, but there's just a few stitches to do here. And then I'll be out of that blind spot. So again, this is our final pass on this quilt. So if you have any questions about this design or the process, now's the time for them. And then as soon as I'm finished this pass, I will go ahead and load the second quilt. And you can see how that's done. If you're enjoying this, I encourage you like, hit the like button and subscribe. If you click on the little bell, you will get notifications whenever I go live. But these live and unscripted episodes are the first and third Friday of each month. And they are streamed in real time. I like to call them Quilting's first reality show. But I hope that you're finding this beneficial to see in real time what quilting looks like in my studio and I make no pretensions to having the right way or the one way of doing things this is just how I do it and I still learn too absolutely you all teach me sometimes you school me so that's the end of the first quilt I'm just going to make a couple preparations for the second one and then I'll stop and chat what I want to do is load the second quilt can we see the big screen huh there we go. I want to load the second quilt fairly close to the first one, so I'm gonna trim out this extra batting. You know, I could have done one batting piece for the both, but as it happens, they're small quilts and I was able to use, for one of them anyway, um, a piece left over from another project. And this is a great opportunity to do that because they don't need to be the same batting. So I'm just trimming it off quickly with my scissors. Tossing it off camera. And now I'm ready to load the next batting and quilt. So let's take a few questions though before I do that. Okay. 
Okay, so someone is asking, oh, to see the design. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll try and show you the design. I honestly do not know that you will be able to see it on a moving camera and on these prints, but I will post pictures of it so that you can. Okay, I'm ready. Hang on. We're getting our cameras in place. There we go. Oh, you can actually see it not too badly. The curls and the swirls, there's a lot of crossovers. Clearly we need another uh, little piece of apparatus so that you don't get my shaky hand in it. We need some kind of stabilizer. Anyway, you're, you're getting some good ideas of it there, right? So that's what it looks like, and here's a little bit bigger picture. And there is the pretty polka dot backing. And Janet used the same thing for her little cornerstones, right? So that ties it all together really nicely. Okay. <laughs> all right, let me put the camera back down. So I will um, take the time over the next couple of days to take some photographs of this and manipulate the lighting a little bit so that you can see the quilting and even show it on the backing. That might show it better. Um, so you get a good view of the quilting, okay? That's sometimes easier than seeing it on air because our lighting is fixed. So any questions before we go on to the second one, Mr. Producer, sir? He's looking. <laughs> there are a couple questions. Here they come. And my coffee cup is empty. I can't even take any more sips. Laura, interesting, does your spoon foot have a slot in it so you can pull the thread back? Yes, it does have a slot. It just has about a just over an eighth inch hole in the center and then the whole thing is about an inch. So that's why it messes a little bit with my visibility. Have to choose it for just the right projects. Lynn, I'm interested in the monthly subscription. Can I please be notified? Yes, if you're on my newsletter um, list, Lynn, you will for sure hear about it and there's going to be a special offer to newsletter subscribers too. So that's a great place to, to learn about it and be the first ones to know when it goes public. Okay, so we're on to quilt number two. So I'm going to move Lucy out of the way just a little bit and advance the quilt a little and then talk to you about just one or two of the considerations with this. <clears throat> Mr. Producer is struggling with cameras. He's got it. So one of the considerations is the size of this roll. Remember I said to you that someone had given me um, four small lap quilts on a flannel backing and they were all end to end. As I quilted it, this roll got quite fluffy. So Lucy will hold a lot and most long arms will, but you just need to be aware of it because what actually starts happening is your throat space diminishes, right? And you're just dealing with a fluffy roll. It limits, you know, the, the, the depth under your roller bar on your long arm rail. Like you have to make adjustments for those sorts of things when you start dealing with this big fluffy roll. When you start getting eight feet of quilt loaded on there or 10 or 12, that starts to get really big. So think about it. It doesn't make it undoable at all. It's just something you need to think about. So in this case, our backing is already loaded. We're just gonna bump the next one up against the first one. Let me grab the batting. And I'm using the same type of batting again, the Hobbs 80-20. 80% cotton, 20% poly. My very favorite workhorse batting. Washes well, wears well, quilts easily. And if you were here for the first one, I trimmed some off the edge because I like to be able to see my fabric. You can just see there, my batting is just a little bit wider than my fabric. So I'm gonna do the same thing again. I really want to see that edge. That helps me gauge when things are straight. Um, for sure, you don't want your batting hanging off the edge. That will catch in the wheels of your long arm. That's never a pretty picture, ask me how I know. And then you've got all those fibers stuck in there and then you've got a cleaning project on your hands. <laughs> Been there, done that. Learned my lesson, trim the batting. Okay. And it just helps to be able to see it right there at the edge. Perfect. So can you see, I bumped my batting up right against, I'm gonna grab quilt number two, which is a twin to quilt number one. And it is four blocks by five, so let's make sure we have it the right way. We do. And this is one of the beauties. Well, this one's smaller, which doesn't really matter. But this is one of the beauties of doing two quilts nose to nose. Usually, I would tell my clients have 
three inches on the bottom of the first quilt and three inches in the top of this quilt, we're saving five or six inches of fabric right there alone, right? And so for the lady again that did four quilts, she saved over and over that you know span of backing fabric that would be in there if you had each quilt done separately. I'm just going to look in case because this quilt might actually fit crossways. Ha, it does people. Okay, so let's talk about this again for a second in case you missed it at the beginning. When I have the option, I will often choose to load my quilts with the length running across my machine because there are fewer passes and advances then and it's just more efficient with my time. If it doesn't matter in terms of directional design or anything like that, all other things being equal, that would be my first choice. Well, the first one I couldn't do that because I was limited for size. My backing was long. My backing would not fit this way. It was too long. So I had to load it, you know, skinny all the way down and put my quilt on right side up. But in the case of this second one now, it actually fits. So this is the long way, one, two, three, four, five. And the other way, there's only short, or there's only four, I'm sorry. So it's actually a little bit smaller than number one was. And there's no need to line them up on the edges or anything like that because it's going to get cut apart, right? No need for any of that. Just getting it on here as straight as possible. And I'm using my visual cues, which involve having this line straight, in this case with the edge of the quilt that went before, because I know that it has a straight line, and having this seam line be straight with my rail, and having these look visually straight from top to bottom, all those cues are helping me get my quilt square and aligned without having to go to a ton of trouble measuring. It is a casual quilt, but I still want the best result possible. Okay, we have a question? Mickey, does the quilt need to turn? Are you asking, does it have to turn? I'm not sure what she's asking. This one is sideways. You can see here, it's four blocks by five, and I've got it long ways this way. So my only consideration was, does that fit on the backing? Yes, it does. The backing is not directional. My quilting is not directional. There's no other reason that would make me turn it the other way, other than if it didn't fit. Does that answer your question, Mickey? I hope so. I'm using the same thread um, combination. I've got an eggshell on the top and a pale pink on the bottom. And only the pale pink because I think it contrasts a little less with this, um, with the pink backing. But really, either one would be fine. That's not a, an if or question. That's just your choice. I like the eggshell on the top. I like the pink on the bottom. Okay, another question? Brenda, why not leave the spoon foot on all the time? In my case, Brenda, because it, um, it reduces my visibility. So my spoon foot is black and I can't see through it. So I can see the hole in the center and I can see the slit where the thread goes through, but it's very hard to place my needle precisely. So that's one of the reasons. And the other is it's absolutely will not work for doing anything with a ruler or stitching in the ditch because it's got a curved edge. You can't bump it up against a ruler. So different feet for different purposes. But you certainly could use it for a lot of edge to edge work if you didn't need to see, you know, directly where your needle was landing. This little camera? Oh my gosh, you guys have been looking at the wrong camera. <laughs> we we need like we need like a stage director, right? Who can be pointing to me where to look and all that stuff. Marie, do you use regular scissors or batting scissors when cutting the batting? In the case of what I, the trimming that I was doing here on the quilt, I was just using regular scissors. As far as, as far as I know, the only difference with batting scissors is that they have a great big long blade, so it's faster and more efficient, but regular scissors certainly works. That's it. Okay. And I see that there's a big old thread hanging here, so I'm going to take that off just so that doesn't get cut, caught in the long arm wheels. Again, not a pretty picture. Okay, need my glasses for quilting. So all I'm gonna do for this second one is baste it so that you can see how it's joining and laying flat and how the process will work. And then that's going to be the end of today's show. So if you do have any more questions, now's the time for them because we're just gonna be a few more minutes basting this.
And again, I'm seeing that there's just a little, this border was eased onto the quilt, just a hair. So I'm addressing that by putting a little bit of tension with my thumb on the front, the area that's already been stitched. And that's pulling this area that I'm fixing to stitch under the needle just a hair faster. It's so minuscule, but if you don't do it, you end up with pleats forming at the back. You end up with this pushing and see how that's running askew. And just that little bit of pulling that I'm applying is all it takes. I actually need to pull a little harder, a little more tension if you need to take up a little more excess. And there we are. And now we'll baste across the top. And again, I've got my channel lock on, so I know that top line is stitching straight. So I'm actually going to adjust my quilt to fit in with my stitching line. I laid it as visually straight as I could, but I'm still making minuscule adjustments as I go. If you prefer to measure it and pin it in place, go for it. But because I have this channel lock feature, this works really well for me. And I'm doing the same thing with my hand. I'm putting a little tension on the area that's already been stitched, pulling the area that's not yet stitched under the needle just a little touch faster. There's just a little excess that I need to ease in along the top. Now, honestly, in my experience, even the flattest quilts, if you don't put a little bit of tension on, they'll still run out in front of your hopper foot, even if they're perfectly flat to start with. That's just the nature of fabric. And that's it for our basting. We are ready to quilt. Just for fun, I'm going to quilt a different design on this one. Uh, still to be determined. You'll have to wait for the pictures to know what I chose. So that will be this afternoon's project. Anyhow, once again, a quick run through. If you are enjoying this episode, I encourage you to click the like button, subscribe, even click the bell and you'll receive notifications when I go live. These streaming sessions are the first and third Friday of each month. And most often it is me doing freehand edge to edge quilting on a whole project from start to finish kind of chatting my way through it, the decisions, the choices, etc. as I go, and taking your questions. I encourage you to share with a friend, and I think that this is really helpful for those who are just getting going in their long-arming journey, or, you know, maybe just haven't done that many quilts over the years. All right, it's all basted and in place. Any more questions? Okay, thank you all so very much for coming. Um, what am I, what am I looking at, hon? Oh, which camera? Oh my goodness. Clearly I'm not very used to this. Okay. Today's topic was basically the fact that I had this long piece of batting, right? And putting two quilts kind of nose to tail. And you can see that right here where I've joined them. It saves a ton of fabric and it saves a lot of time because I've only had to load one time and I'm getting to do two quilts. So you could conceivably do different quilts. They don't have to be identical like this one is. They just have to have the same backing. But in fact, as a little option, I have actually had people do um, usually smaller quilts, but actually sew different backings together and then have different quilts. Does that make sense? So that's a little more advanced. It needs a little more thought because you got to be sure about them fitting. So be confident of your measurements or your client's measurements. But that is a possibility, especially when you're working with smaller quilts and loading each one separately is a bit unwieldy. Um, I've done mini quilts before that fit this way, having two or three of them on different backing fabrics, but all connected. So it can be a really significant time saver and make your life a lot easier. So it's an option and now you know how to do it. So that's great. So just a quick reminder, um, my Freehand Quilting Masterclass, which is a comprehensive course, um, enrollment is opening up again in late October. So if you're not on my newsletter already, I encourage you to do that because there will be advanced notification. There's a number of workshops and free things coming up in advance of it. 
You can decide if you like my quilting style or not. There's no commitment for those workshops. So they're just open for anyone to attend. So my newsletter will give you notifications of that. If you want to subscribe, easiest way is go to my website, stitchedbysusan.com. And there's a little pop-up form there for a little freebie. Um, I think it's three steps to freehand freedom right now. And so if you sign up for that, then you'll also be getting my newsletter. And also on my website, there's a classes page. And if you want more information on the masterclass, including a detailed syllabus of all that's included in all the modules, that is all right there. And you can read that at your leisure and know what it's all about. But this is my style of quilting. This is what I'm all about. Helping quilters get comfortable with decisions and processes, taking the kind of mystery and certainly intimidation and fear out of this process of freehand quilting. If you wish to support this channel, super simple, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And so many of you have been so generous there and we appreciate it hugely. That is how we upgrade our equipment and keep producing hopefully a better and better YouTube channel for you. So thanks so very much for joining today. And remember, first and third Friday of every month, those times, same station, and I will see you next time.